from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Um, my name is Ann Brenner, and I am the Area Specialist for the Hebraic Section of the Library of Congress. And I'm going to be giving a lecture today called From Russia with Love. And it's all about illustrated children's books in Hebrew from 1917 till 1925. So let's begin. The world of Hebrew books is a world of black and white. Yes, there are the exceptions, the illuminated manuscripts, the Haggadot, the brightly colored artist books. But when I am upstairs in our stacks amongst the rare books, I am in a fairly sober world of black and white with shades of brown and parchment for variation. So when I opened a folder one day, quite at random, and found myself gazing down at a book open to the image you see here, you can imagine my surprise. It was as though I peeked into a nest of sparrows, only to find some gorgeous, brightly plumed bird of paradise. What was this book? Clearly a picture book for children, but a very old one, and it was this that surprised me so greatly. Today, of course, in Israel, Hebrew picture books for children are churned out by the dozens, but this one was printed in, and I look back at the cover, Moscow, Odessa and in a style that stunned me by its avant-garde beauty and its whiff of the early 1900s. No date, no author, just a title proclaiming it to be La Sevivon, To the Dreidel, published by Hotsaat Omanut, the art press. In other words, as I was soon to discover, one of the very first picture books ever published for children in Hebrew, and the story behind its publication proved fascinating. It all began in Moscow in the spring of 1917. Russia was in the throes of revolution. There were battles in the streets, barricades on the corners, but even that wasn't enough to stop a group called the Friends of the Hebrew Language from holding their annual meeting in Moscow. Now, this was a group made up of Jews from all across the far-flung Russian Empire, and they had some very distinguished members, among them, several of the richest Jews in Tsarist Russia, and also Chaim Nachman Bialik, the national Hebrew poet whose prestige in the Jewish world was unmatched. Their one goal, a goal to which they were passionately committed, was a revival of Hebrew as a spoken language, seeing it as a natural choice for the pioneers rebuilding the Jewish homeland in Palestina. The meeting was duly reported afterwards in the Jewish press. Um, here, for example, is Hatzfira, published in Warsaw shortly after the meeting took place. The meeting, as we read, ended in a resolution to establish new Hebrew language kindergartens and schools throughout Russia, new publications for children in Hebrew, evening classes for adults with Hebrew as a language of instruction. Ambitious plans indeed, yet the newspaper did not consider this meeting front page stuff. No, it was buried in the back pages, page 15 in an issue with only 16 pages. Do the editors think this was just a lot of talk? Perhaps. There had, after all, been many such meetings over the past years. But this time, things were different. There may have been fighting out there in the streets, but the revolution was also a time for great optimism and hopes for real change. Tsarist Russia, after all, had been no friend to the Jews, and the ambitious program hammered out by the Friends of the Hebrew Language was, in fact, incredibly successful. Now operating under a new name, Tarbut, or culture, this group opened some 200 new schools and kindergartens across Russia, and the others saw the founding of new presses for publishing books and periodicals for children in Hebrew. One of these new presses was called Omanut, and in today's lecture, we will be looking at this press and at the woman behind it, Shoshana Zlatopolsky Persets, the 24-year-old founder of Omanut and its guiding spirit over the years to come. 
Shoshana was a daughter of Hillel Zatopolsky, a sugar tycoon well known for his generous patronage of Hebrew culture. And you can see him here um, sitting down on the left. He looks very dignified. Uh, Hillel Zlatopolsky was, for example, one of the chief patrons of Habima, the Hebrew theater troupe in Moscow that went on to world fame. He also financed this Hebrew magazine for children, founded right in the middle of the Russian Revolution, Shtilim, with this beautiful banner on the title page. So this was Shoshana's father, and our heroine was thus brought up in an atmosphere of culture and of reverence for the Hebrew book. In later years, she was to recall her parents' home in Moscow as a meeting place for Hebrew writers and thinkers, a place where the Hebrew book was, as she said, something sacred, Dvar Shebek Dusha. Yet even as a young girl, she realized the sense of futility these Hebrew writers felt, their despair at not having an audience for whom to write. So she vowed to herself that one day she would create an audience for these writers. Now, in 1917, as I have just mentioned, Shoshana was only 24 years old. She was married, and her husband came from a family very much like her own, that is, a very wealthy Jewish family passionately devoted to Hebrew education and culture. So when her father turned 50 that year, she did what any dutiful daughter does for her father's 50th birthday. She gave him half a million rubles and said, Daddy, let's open a publishing house for children's books in Hebrew. And so they did. Thus, Omanut Press was born. And here you can see their logo. It was surely no coincidence that Shoshana named her new publishing house Omanut, art in Hebrew. In Russia, the world of art Mir Iskutsva was a leading periodical for the Russian avant-garde, and here we see a few examples from their journals. By linking her own venture to this prestigious arbiter of taste, Shoshana was proclaiming her own commitment to the highest standards of modern art and literature. And indeed, Omanut Press did become known for the beauty of its publications. In later years, one of Shoshana's colleagues recalled how Shoshana would look at each new book that came off the press, rejoicing not only in the beautiful Hebrew of the text, but also in the high-quality paper, the exquisite black fonts, the perfect binding. He said that watching Shoshana look at one of those new books was like watching the rabbi back home in his childhood village as he looked at his perfect etrog or citron fruit during the Sukkot holiday. Both were acts of what is known in Judaism as hidur mitzvah, that is, the sanctification of Jewish law through beauty. In creating Omanut Press, Shoshana's goal was to make Hebrew the natural mother tongue for the Jewish children in Russia. And she decided that the best way to do this was by giving them the very best of world literature for children. She wanted to give them the pleasure that other children experienced through the wonderful books of such authors as Lewis Carroll, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, but to give it to them in Hebrew, a Hebrew that would mold their taste and literary expectations as they grew into adulthood. And indeed, it was in the field of translation that Omanut was to become famous. But before this goal could be accomplished, tragedy struck. And when her four-year-old son died, Shoshana turned her energies for a time in another direction, creating a series of picture books for toddlers, which she named Gamliel, after her son. In an interview many years later, Shoshana explained her decision to create this series, saying that children of other nations were brought up on the wonderful picture books illustrated by the likes of Walter Crane, Arthur Rackham, Ivan Bilbian. But Jewish children, and this is a quote, had no books of their own through which to enjoy a similar experience. It was thus through personal tragedy that some of the most beautiful Hebrew books for children were ever created. The first three titles in the Gamliel series of picture books 
were translations of Russian books together with their beautiful original illustrations. I think this must have been quite a coup for Shoshana, for she acquired the publishing rights from Knebel Publishing, publisher of the most magnificent children's books in Moscow at the beginning of the 20th century. The Library of Congress owns two of these three very, very rare Hebrew books, one of them a translation of Hans Christian Andersen's The Nightingale, another a swashbuckling tale of adventure called The Enchanted Ship with illustrations by Dmitry Mitrochin, a well-known Russian artist. Now, although none of the, the books in this series is dated, I tend to think that this, The Enchanted Ship, was the first one, and that's because of the image here. This image appears on the other side of the cover, and it is full page. When I first saw this picture, I just saw a logo for the series, a stylized plant with the name Gamliel there at the bottom. But now it seems to me more than that. I now see it as a stylized tree of life. And the name Gamliel nestling there so tiny at the root of the tree, it turns it into a memorial to the publisher's infant son, the one whose sudden death prompted this series of Hebrew picture books. This picture was commissioned by Dmitry Mitrochin, the same artist who created the illustrations for the Russian edition of the book. And so far as I know, it does not appear in any of the other books from the Gamliel series. To get back to the first three books, before Shoshana could actually publish any of them, the Russian Revolution caught up with her, with the Bolsheviks nationalizing the press and taking over her equipment. So just a year after opening, and before a single book was even published, Omanut closed its doors in, Russia, in Moscow and moved to Odessa, a bustling port on the Black Sea, located in the Ukraine, and as yet, untouched by the revolution. It was in Odessa, therefore, that the first three books were printed, and that was only the beginning. Odessa was a flourishing center of Jewish culture, home to such luminaries of modern Hebrew literature as Mendele Mocher Svarim and Chaim Nachman Bialik. But the events of 1917 sent even more Jewish writers and artists pouring in. With such a stable of local talent from which to draw, Odessa was to prove fertile ground indeed for Omanut. Bialik himself created the text for at least two of Omanut's subsequent books, one of them a beautiful rhymed version of a medieval fox fable. This is a wonderful book. Um, if you look closely at the bottom picture, you can see that the the chicken who is talking with the fox, or the rooster rather, has, a, uh, has some crutches. This rooster is crippled, and, she ha and this poor rooster has to hang back from the rest of the crowd. But it is this crippled rooster who saves the day and saves the other roosters from this wily fox. Zalman Schnur, another famous novelist, both in Hebrew and in Yiddish, wrote the poem for To the Dreidel, the book which we saw at the beginning of this lecture and home to that darling goat we all saw um, at the beginning of this slideshow. Another book created in Odessa was a translation of Asher Ginsberg's re renowned Zionist thinker better known by his pen name, Ahad Ha'am. And here we have um, a Hebrew version of a Russian ver version of, a, of what I think is an Arabic or Persian folk tale. It's that wonderful folk tale where the father and son go out on the donkey and everyone who comes up to them tells them who should be riding the donkey, either the father or the son. So in the end, just trying to please everyone, they just both get off and they both carry the donkey off. Um, it's one of those situations where no matter what you do, you can't please anybody. So we have Chaim Nachman Bialik, Zalman Schnur, and Achad Am. That's quite a constellation of writers for Shoshana. It was also an Odessa. It was also Odessa that provided the beautiful illustrations accompanying these and half a dozen other books in the Gamliel series. These illustrations were all created by Jewish art students in the Odessa School of Art, a group of four young men in their early twenties who signed their name collectively as Chavurat Tsairim, 
a group of painters in Hebrew. Here we see their motto as it appears on the cover of the books. Um, if you follow the arrow, it's there in the left-hand corner. And here we see it enlarged and translated. History of the capital H then stepped in once again. And as the Bolsheviks advanced on the Ukraine, Shoshana relocated, this time to Frankfurt am Main in Germany. There she republished the beautiful picture books illustrated by the young art students in Odessa. It was also in Frankfurt that she began publishing the polished Hebrew translations of world literature for children by which the press was to become famous. But though published in Frankfurt, the translations came, needless to say, from Russia with love. One day, as Shoshana was to relate years later, and I'm quoting, Arya Smiatitsky, the editor-in-chief, came to Frankfurt from Russia, and as he plunked his suitcase down in front of us, we all crowded around him. Out of that suitcase came nothing less than 60 Hebrew translations of the finest books for children that world literature could offer. Robinson Crusoe, Alice in Wonderland, The Tales of Oscar Wilde, and the list goes on and on. In 1925, Omanut left Europe altogether, establishing itself once and for all in Tel Aviv. Yet the end of Omanut's odyssey was also pr to prove something of the beginning for Shoshana, whose contributions to Jewish education were quick quickly recognized by the leaders of the emerging Jewish state. For years, she played a key role in the Tel Aviv Department of Education, and in 1949, she was elected to the first Knesset, that is, the first parliament of the newly established State of Israel, chairing the Committee of Education and Culture. That she did not become the Minister of Education was due to the fact that the religious Zionist party objected to having a woman serve as minister, and that was her own party. But Shoshana seems to have accepted that decision very graciously. Uh, nevertheless, I think the incident finds an echo in a story written just a few years later by Shai Agnon, the great Hebrew novelist who was to go on and win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1967. The story was written on the occasion of Shoshana's 50th birthday, and it is such a moving tribute to this remarkable woman that I'd like to read Agnon's words to you now um, in a very abridged translation. I always think it's sacrilege translating Agnon, but here I am committing sacrilege so that I can bring you this beautiful story. Once upon a time, there was a woman who loved to study the words of our ancient rabbis. But when she would go into the house of study, the young men studying there mocked her. This is no place for women, they would jeer. But still she came every day chose a book from the shelves and sat down to study. One day, the young men decided to play a trick on her. They got up a large book with empty pages, wrote the wisdom of wi women on the spine and on its cover, and then placed it on the shelf alongside the other books. When Shoshana came the next day, she spied this new book on the shelf and her eyes lit up. Finally, she said to herself, finally, a book honoring the wisdom and knowledge of women. But when she opened the book, all she found were blank pages. She looked up and saw the young men laughing at her, and her eyes filled with tears, and she wept. When she got home, her children saw that she had been crying, so they began crying too. She filled their hands with nuts and sweets, but still they cried. So finally she said, look, if you'll be good and stop crying, I'll tell you a story. So they dry their eyes and listen to the story and forgot their sorrows. And because she loved her children, she wrote these stories down, taking care to use the finest paper and the most beautiful black ink and a flowing hand that was careful with the grammar and the spelling. And when the children saw how beautiful the books were, inside and out, their hearts longed for these books and immediately wanted to read them. She therefore made many such books, so many that their titles alone would fill up the blank pages of that Wisdom of Women book back in the house of study. 
And when the young people grew up, they praised this woman for all she had taught them and applied to her the verse from Proverbs saying, Many women have done excellently, but you have exceeded them all. By the time Omanut Press closed its doors in 1945, its books had become a staple of education for several generations of Israeli youth, introducing them to such world-class authors as Victor Hugo, Jules Verne, Charles Dickens. I can attest to this from personal experience. Just a few weeks ago, two Israeli generals came to visit our reading room, and when they asked me what I was working on at present, I mentioned this program for children's books and Omanut Press. Neither of them was familiar with the name Omanut Press, but when I mentioned their translations, the Hebrew version of Robinson Crusoe and Jules Verne's Captain Hatteras, their eyes lit up. They had grown up on those books, and they started comparing notes about their favorite childhood heroes right then and there. They were not familiar, however, with the exquisite picture books with which my own odyssey into the remarkable career of Shoshana Parasitz began. And indeed, that's not surprising. These beautiful picture books were apparently never reissued in Israel, and they remain almost completely unknown even to dedicated bibliophiles. I would like to give the audience um, a taste of this wonderful literature that we've been talking about. So today we're going to have a dramatic reading of one of Chaim Nachman Bialik's poems. It's a translation from the Russian Tom Thumb into Hebrew. It's a classic in Israeli children's literature till today. It's, it's a beautiful work. And it was first printed in a children's magazine that was printed in Warsaw in 1911. I'd like to show you the cover because it's absolutely exquisite. Isn't that incredible? I mean, there was nothing like it up until the time. Warsaw, 1911. It only came out for seven months, and it's extremely rare. And most places um, that you do find it in the world, in the great libraries, say the National Library of Israel or, uh, or the um, St. Petersburg Library in Russia, it's missing this beautiful cover because it was so beautiful, people just ripped it off and kept it for themselves. So you open it up, and all you have is this black and white cover. But the Library of Congress, with its wonderful collections, is fortunate in having all seven months of these issues with a beautiful cover. So Bialik published this Hebrew version of the Tom Thumb in, inside this beautiful periodical, um, Hashachar, which means the dawn. And here is a picture um, on the right-hand side. You see a little photograph of Bialik himself and then the Hebrew version of Tom Thumb. So I've made a translation in English, which I hope captures the rhyme scheme and something of the, I hope it captures something of the playful spirit of the original. The image that you see here comes from the second edition of Tom Thumb, which, which was published by Omanut Press itself in 1923. And I will be taking the part of Tom Thumb. I'm the one writing the grasshopper outside the window, and my colleague, Abdullahi Ahmed, is the eight-year-old child that you see jumping up for joy in the picture. So, without further ado, Tom Thumb by Chaim Nachman Bialik. Who are knocking at my windows, come? Why, it's a boy, no bigger than my thumb. Tell me, child, what's your name? The name of your parents, and whence you came? I have no country, nor yet a mother, no father, sister, aunt, nor brother. Where, where do you mean to go, my child? To wander through the forest wild. Have you a crust on which to feed? Oh, for that, no need, no need. All the earth is mine, is mine. I sip from flowers on dewdrops dine. On a beel's back I ride the land, a cobweb form I rein in hand. Golden bees, embroidered fleas, bring me manna whenever I please. And for my glory a butterfly sews, a many-colored suit of clothes. But when it's dark and the snow lies deep, how will you lay down to sleep? A mushroom's cap will keep me warm. Under its roof I'll be safe from harm. An acorn shell all snug and tight will be my bed to sleep at night. Folded hands to pillow my head, a soft green leaf to cover my bed. 
and to keep me safe all night, a firefly will shine its light. When morning comes, how will you wake? Why, when the dawn just starts to break. With the kiss of the sun's gold ray, I'll open my eyes and start the day. I'll get up and wash and start to chase the bees and the fleas all over the place. I'll peer into every hole I see. Nothing can be kept from me. Come in, my lad, and sit with me. We will have some cake and a pot of tea. Oh, no, no, I can't, my child. I must go flit around the while. We'll meet tomorrow since you entreat. Make sure there's something good to eat. So shalom for now. I have much to do. Shalom, shalom. shalom. Peace, Peace unto, unto you. you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.